Tonight's episode of Legacy Battle is brought to you by Atlas Benefits. Atlas Benefits has solutions for your insurance needs. Atlas Benefits can help you obtain Medicare, health, or life insurance, and employee benefits. You can find them on the web at www.atlasbenefits.com. Or you can contact Rob Ducey or Roy Smith at 727-600-2892 and mention Legacy Battle Podcast. Atlas Benefits has all the solutions for your insurance needs. Enjoy the show. This is Legacy Battle. Make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and join that Facebook group. I am Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. Here with me tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King, Penn State Collegiate All-Star, Kevin Adams, Ball State athlete, Paul Havocott. And we're joined tonight by a former MLB player, played with nine major league teams, including the Expos, who we're going to be discussing tonight. And he spent his first six seasons there. He has three seasons in the top 10 for wins, ERA, and WAR, and two seasons in the top 10 for complete games, and first in shutouts for two seasons. How about that for some for some stats? Veteran pitcher, Jeff Facero. Jeff, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. We're Looking honored. forward to this. You know, yeah. I, listened, I listened last week to the Otis Nixon one, and I, I found it very enjoyable, and I like the Mount Rushmore stuff. Excellent, excellent. It's, uh, it's it's getting harder and harder to find Expos players. So, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's been a while since they've been around. But yeah, tonight we're doing the Mount Rushmore of the Expos, and we're going to start this out with Pedro Martinez. You guys, picture behind me here, uh, great pitcher throughout his career. Um, so he played in the MLB from '92 to 2000 to 2009. You know, he was an eight-time All-Star in his career. He started his peak, though, in his last season, actually, with uh, the Expos. Um, it was in 97. Uh, he established himself at that point as one of the best pitchers in MLB uh, history. Um, he won three Cy Young Awards. His first one was that last season with Montreal in 97. Uh, he was a runner-up twice as well for that. He ended his career with a 2.93 ERA, um, the sixth lowest by a pitcher with at least 2,500 innings. Um, since 1920, he reached 3,000 strikeout mark and fewer innings than any pitcher except for Randy Johnson. Um, he's the only pitcher to compile over 300 career strikeouts with fewer than 3,000 innings pitched. So overall, as a career, this man was dominant. Um, he was a smaller, he was a smaller pitcher for his type of pitching style. He was a power pitcher. His whip uh, was the lowest of any live ball era uh, starting pitcher. His adjusted ERA was the best of any pitcher in MLB history. Um, he had third highest strikeout to walk ratio. Uh, he dominated hitter-friendly ballparks, uh, faced a lot of tough competition uh, during um, the steroid era, uh, especially when he was pitching for the Montreal. Steroids were starting to get big then. Uh, he was elected into the Hall of Fame in 2015 in his first year of eligibility, um, and only the second Dominican to be enshrined. His career really took off after leaving the Expos, unfortunately. But it's it's with the Expos is where it all started and got him to be the pitcher uh, that he became. Um, you know, he had one of the fastest fastballs in the game. He was able to keep his control in check. Uh, 90, in 1995, with the Expos, he threw a perfect game through nine innings. Unfortunately, <laughs> that game went into ten innings, and he gave up a hit in the bottom of the tenth. Um, to take away the, the perfect game. But um, he had that, that should still count as a perfect game in my book because he pitched the full nine innings and, and was perfect through them. Um, are, you, are you sure that was Pedro and not Dennis Martinez? No, Dennis had a perfect game in 91 for the Expos. Okay. Yeah, this, okay. Pedro's, Pedro's was – he went into the 10th inning and gave up a hit, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, I, go I, got to, I got to see both of them. 
Okay. Yeah, awesome. my, my brother's just trying to make me look bad. And then, yeah, you know, that's bro- no, brother, brother crime that. there. My God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin. Finish up. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, anyways, um, in his in his last year, you know, he posted the seventeen eight record, four shoutouts, won the Cy Young Award, as I mentioned. He led the league in ERA. He had a one point nine zero ERA that last year with Montreal. Three hundred and five strikeouts, thirteen complete games. Um, was one of the only Expos to ever win the NL Cy Young Award. Um, tied the record for a second highest single season total game record and was the first right-handed <clears throat> pitcher ever or, or since 1912 to reach 300 strikeouts with an ERA under 2.0. Um, he had a four-seam fastball, power curveball, cutter, two-seam fastball, and a changeup. All those pitches were well above average. He was a great pitcher. Yes, he's w- more known for when he left the Expos with, with Boston and everything, but he started his career here. He got him to where he is, and he's definitely top five Expo. If you look at lists of like, greatest players, he's on a bunch of them for the Expos. So, Jeff, you you, you pitched with him, obviously, in Montreal, but also in Boston. Uh, you know, you were there in Boston with him as well. So tell us about Pedro and his pitching style and – his career, like Kevin said, his career was shorter with Montreal, and he is more well known for for Boston. But but tell us about Pedro. Well, I mean, if if we would have played in '94, Pedro would have been known for Montreal. Also, you know, he got them the World Series that they needed in Boston, so that was a big difference between Montreal. But you know, he was first coming up. He was young. I think what was he 22, 21 when he came up with us. 20, you know, and. Uh, he was a little skinny kid. You didn't think that was going to last like he did. Um, but he was probably, as far as a teammate goes, one of the best teammates to play with. He uh, he was fun-loving off the field, but when you put him on the field, he was all business. You know, and, you know, he had that rep about he wasn't afraid of anybody and doing anything. So, basically, we – our teammates, had, we all had to sit on the bench every night he pitched in case there was something funny going to happen with him. But, uh, you know, he honed his delivery. He honed all his pitches. He had three pitches, fastball, curveball, and a changeup. I don't know, curveball, slider, whatever you want to call it. It was just a hard, sharp breaking ball. And he could throw all three of them for strikes anytime he wanted to throw them for a strike. You know, and playing, like when he was in Boston and I was in Montreal or in Seattle, and you think about the lineup I had, when I was there from 96 to 99, or 97 to 99, they, uh, those guys were afraid to face him. I mean, I'm talking about Griffey, Martinez, Buner, Rodriguez. Nobody wanted to face him. They were all afraid to face him. I mean, that just tells you what kind of pitcher it is. The best hitters, even the best hitters don't want to face him. They're not even looking for that challenge because he was so good. I mean, he's, he was top of the line. And, Personality-wise, player-wise, he was top of line, too. So Jeff mentioned the 1994 season. If any of you viewers are watching and you want to know more about that 1994 season, go back into our archives, watch the Mike Kingery show where we debated who would have won the 1994 World Series. I'm not going to tell you who we picked to win that, but check it out. You'll get a lot of information on that 94 Expos team. Let's move on to Dennis Martinez. Okay. El Presidente. <laughs> Dennis Martinez. Um, he, Martinez has his, the distinction of being the first Nicaraguan player in Major League Baseball history. So the first one to ever come from that country. Um, he began his career with Baltimore Orioles, and he had some, some success there. He was the uh, uh, league leader in wins in 1981. Um, but while he was there, he he developed an alcohol addiction, and um, – this caused a lot of issues between him. Eventually, it began to um, it began to uh, take a toll on his play as well and his um, uh, dealings with the team. So eventually, he was dealt to Montreal, and Montreal was his um, was his place to sort of get back on track and, and his second chance. So in Montreal, um, he was with the club for eight seasons, nineteen eighty six to nineteen ninety three. Uh, he was the opening day starter um, from 1988 to 1993, establishing him, himself as the ace of the staff. Um, 1992, uh, sorry, 1990, 91, 92, 
he made the NL All-Star team. His finest season was in 1991. He led the league in ERA with 2.39, um, complete games, nine, and shutouts, five. And then really the signature day, signature game in his entire career um, occurred on July 28th, 1991. El Presidente became El Perfecto. He pitched a 13th perfect game in Major League Baseball history, and he took down the LA Dodgers, who were the first first place team in the NOS at that time. Uh, this was a lineup that consisted of Brett Butler, Juan Samuel, Eddie Murphy, um, Daryl Strawberry, Cal Daniels, and Mike Sosha. And he totally shut these guys down uh, to get that perfect game. So Dennis Martinez, you look at what he did with the Expos. I mean, he was an ace for six years. He achieved perfection. Um, he was able to win uh, double-digit games several of those seasons. Uh, one of the great Expos of all time. So Jeff, Dennis seemed like he was kind of like the veteran of the staff, too. I mean, did you guys go to him? Was he someone that you all kind of looked at like, hey, this is the ace. We need to follow his lead? Yeah. Dennis, like, when you got when I got first got there, I got there in ninety one that year that uh, you know, and he was like everybody said he was like hard to get along with, you know, he wasn't very receptive to guys. You know, and I came up in the bullpen and he was really hard on go- bullpen guys if they blew games for him and stuff like that. <clears throat> but for me he kinda took me under my wing for some reason. I mean, I don't know if it's because I saw him well that year for him and throwing out the bullpen and getting some saves later in the season for him. But uh, he kind of took me under my wing. And, you know, I look back at that season for him in 91. You know, our team was horrendous that year. I think, you know, and for him to win 14 games, put up those numbers, I think he should have been a guy that could have very easily had a lot of votes for Cy Young that year to put up the numbers he did on a team. You know, you went, you have a winning record on a team that's like – 30 games under 500, that's pretty impressive for a pitcher. Tells you you're out there for the seven, eight, nine innings, whatever you got to be out there for to get those wins. Um, but, yeah, and then, like, a couple of years later with Dennis, he took me – they moved me from the bullpen to the starting rotation, and he's the one that came up to me. I think it was his last year there in 93. He goes, you got to come up with a routine now. You know, and he taught me a routine to warm up, what to do in between games and all this stuff. So <clears throat> for me, Dennis was one of my early mentors. And, you know, I think he did that with Pedro a little bit when Pedro came over because Pedro had been in the bullpen with the Dodgers and had not been a starter. <clears throat> he kind of got us set in our ways. I mean, when you look at that team that we had with me, Kenny Hill and him, we all learned from Dennis. We all watched Dennis pitch. You know, he's, he was a constant uh, professional out there. And I looked at his numbers, and I, uh, this guy's numbers are pretty close. Maybe ERA is a little high, but not bad for a possible Hall of Fame numbers. Yeah. I had him up there with Jack Morris, and Jack Morris went in. I mean, yeah. I mean, so. I didn't realize that he had as many wins and stuff that he did, but. I mean, some of those – his numbers are pretty solid. And, I, you know, he could be maybe one of those guys later that get in. Led the Indians to the World Series too. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to our final pitcher tonight. That's going to be Steve Rogers. I know we're not talking Captain America here. but yeah. uh, <laughs> He so might right, have been from Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> right-handed pitcher. Spent his entire career with the Expos. Um, can't say that about too many people today. It's 1973 to 1985. Um, I think he's the only player to do that uh, that we're talking about tonight. But five-time All-Star, 158 wins, and that is the all-time franchise record. And that includes the Washington Nationals, who technically are the same franchise. Yeah. So he still has that lead there. Um, he's eighth all-time with a 3.18 ERA. Pretty good. There's some nationals that are that are, that are ahead of him there, but um, for the Expos, he's first all time in strikeouts with 1,621 and a franchise best 2,837 innings pitched. That's a thousand more than the number two player. So this guy was synonymous with pitching with the Expos. 
Uh, in 2005, he was inducted into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, which uh, we'll know how we missed him on our Canadian Mount Rushmore show. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> top, you know, he wasn't actually born in Canada, that's why. But top five in Cy Young voting three times and finished second for a Rookie of the Year. So he, he came pretty close on getting some hardware there. 1982 season was his best as an expo. Um, he won the National League pitching title, led the league in ERA, war, second in win-loss percentage, and nine seasons he was top 10 in shutouts, and he's 57th all-time in Major League Baseball history in shutouts. So you think about how many pitchers have gone through 100 and, oh my goodness, like 140 years of baseball now. He's 57th all-time. That's pretty good. <clears throat> good fielder, too. Uh, he was number one in fielding percentage uh, twice for pitchers, and what was kind of unique about him was his, his delivery. Like when he would throw his pitch, it almost looked like he was going to fall down. <laughs> it was really weird delivery. You know, you get those pitchers in like a Dontrell Willis, uh, Hideo Nomo, you know, they come in, they have some, like one or two really good years and then they kind of get figured out. Rogers, they never really figured out that, that technique. So, so Jeff, that's what I want to ask you about him is, Technique, mechanics, and pitching is so important. So how is it that a guy that would throw an unusual style like that can be so effective, in, in your opinion? In my opinion, is because he still was balanced over the rubber. So he had the balance over the rubber, which entitled him to do what he did out front with his falling motion. And it gave him – his, his release point was consistent with everything he did. No matter what it did, there's you look at a lot of guys that have weird deliveries, and if they're having success, to me it comes to the, they've got the balance point over the rubber, and they're get, they're getting their arm in position to throw a ball. Whatever happens after that, body wise out the end, really doesn't matter too much, you know. <clears throat> and he's another guy, you know. You did, never heard much about him. I'm, I'd met him a couple times. He was out of Montreal before I got there. And he'd come back every once in a while. He's in the players' uh, union right now. So I've talked to him, communicated with him. He's another guy. I looked at his numbers. I go, these numbers are unbelievable. He had a couple bad years where it hurt him a little bit. But ultimately, he's another guy. That, I mean, if he might have pitched five more years in Montreal and put, kept putting up the numbers he put up, he'd be another consideration for a possible expo getting into a Hall of Fame. I mean – I was kind of shocked when I looked at some when you when you go back and you don't think about it and you look at some of the numbers some of these guys put up in Montreal because you never heard about Montreal nobody did right. down there I mean I grew up a National League fan and Montreal was yeah, it's Montreal you know but then you you look at some of these numbers that Steve put up I mean that they're pretty, some pretty impressive seasons for a guy in a city that wasn't there's no recognition right right let's move on to the outfield we're gonna start with larry walker and i was hoping you'd go catcher because we're talking about pitchers but i'll go larry uh booger nicknamed booger he's born in 1966 in maple ridge canada he's actually early on trying to be a goalie for the montreal Canadiens, so he's really montreal through and through and pretty much a shoe in for this Mount Rushmore, I'm going to be crying otherwise if, if people don't vote him in. But instead of being a goalie, he ends up being one of Canada's best-known players. Uh, he ends up playing 17 years in the majors as a right fielder. Larry's with Montreal specifically from 89 to 94. Then he goes on to the Rockies until 2003 and finishes up in St. Louis. Spent six years with the Expos, had great stats, uh, 1,311 RBIs, uh, 384 specifically for Montreal, 383 home runs, 99 for Montreal, batted 313 in his career with 471 doubles. He had a career 281 batting average and 147 doubles for Montreal. Guy made things happen offensively. He was a hit machine, finished his career with uh, 2160 hits. So, in terms of how Canada feels about him, uh, they love him. Selected as Canada's top athlete in 1998 despite injuries. He still had a 363 uh, average that season, becoming the first Canadian to win the batting title uh, this century after Tip O'Neill. He was coming off a, fine, a phenomenal year in 97 with the Rockies, 
um, put together one of the finest statistical years, but I know we're talking about the Expos, but he still was good late in the game. Um, he's a recent Hall of Fame inductee at 2020, and basically his Canadian awards, nine-time Tip O'Neill uh, Award, Canadian Baseball Player of the Year in 1987, 90, 92, 94, 95, 97, 98, let me catch my breath here, 2001, 2002, seven-time Gold Glove Award uh, National League outfielder in um, 92, 93, 97, 98, 99, 01, and 02, five-time National League All-Star, three-time Silver Slugger Award, National League outfielder in 92, 97, 99. In 1994, led the National League in doubles, tied with Craig Biggio. And in 1997, uh, National League home run champion and National League MVP, uh, batting champion in 98, 99, and 01. I think you guys are getting the picture. This guy is the man. My gosh. Let me hear your thoughts on Larry Booger Walker. Is there, Jeff, is there any argument against Larry that you can think of? Or is he just no. that good? He was, he was the first guy that I really consider having five tools that I ever played with. I mean, when I got when I got called up, he was up. He was injured in ninety. When did he, was it ninety? I forget what year he injured his knee. You know that kind of slowed him down a little bit. But it was it was fun. It you know for me in Montreal from ninety one to ninety. I guess well four because he was the first one gone. But that outfield we had with him, Grissom and Alou, it was so fun having them out there. But you know, there's I I'd never seen a guy throw the ball like he threw it from the outfield. Accuracy, arm strength. He could run balls down. He could steal bases. He could hit for average. He could hit for power. Whatever he wanted, whatever he needed to do. And I just, you know, I was kind of shocked it took this long to get them get him into the Hall of Fame. I mean, his numbers. You know, everybody says Colorado inflates numbers, but, you know, you look at the first six years he's in Montreal, you know, he would have, he, his numbers would have stayed. He would have had the numbers there too. Right. Um, you know, so I, it was a big disappointment for us, you know, losing him in, after the 94 season because we knew what we still had as a team, but we started losing parts of it and it hurt. Um, you know, but I got to play with him again in Colorado, and his his skills were still the same there, except it was a lot easier for him to throw. He could throw guys out at first base if they hit the ball hard enough to him with the short – he'd play short, shallow right field out there. And because if it was over his head, it was out of the ballpark. <laughs> um, I mean, he was, he was a smart player, too. He understood the game. He understood where he was, what he was doing. Um, you know, and he was – his nickname fit him well, though, too. <laughs> <laughs> Care to elaborate? <laughs> uh, he just, I mean, he, he's, he's just, I don't, <laughs> it's hard to say how you elaborate on that, but I mean, it's just, you know, it's booger. It's just, it fits him well. It's just knowing his personality, knowing how he is, what he it does. It sounds like it could be mischievous. Was he mischievous? Uh, yes, he was a little bit. He was. Uh, he could be a prankster. Yes, he could be. But uh, you know, Wallach's the one that gave him the name. So nice. go back and ask Tim what he really was thinking about when he gave it to him. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our leadoff hitter, Tim Raines. So I just want to point out that Paul just <laughs> rattled off all kinds of awards for Larry Walker. And don't get me wrong, Larry Walker's a great player. Love him. But majority, 95% of that was outside of his time with the Expos, Paul. So thanks for rattling off stats that don't really matter towards the Expos like, like we're talking about. Just want to throw that out there, Paul. I'd be like taking a pitcher that's well-known for the Red Sox as opposed to the Expos <laughs> and putting him behind you when we're talking about Jeff. Hey, he, he did the same <laughs> stuff that, that, that your guy did. So my guy, Pedro, has just as much an argument. So anyway, let's, let's, get, let's get to Tim Raines. <laughs> Rock. Um, this dude was a beast running the bases, uh, played left field, um, for six teams between 79 and 2002. Uh, but he was best known for his seasons with Montreal. Um, unlike Larry Walker, all of 
Tim Raines' accomplishments happened while he was with the Expos, uh, with exception of the World Series uh, wins that he got. Uh, but, so, Montreal selected him uh, fifth round in the 77 draft. Um, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2017. Um, a seven-time All-Star, four-time stolen base champion, and a National League batting champion. Raines was one of the best leadoff hitters and base, best base runners in, in the history of baseball. All his All-Star games was while he was with the Expos. He won the Silver Slugger Award and NL Batting Champion in 86 as an Expo. His four-time stolen bases titles were during his time with the Expos. Paul, do you see my pattern here? The Expos <laughs> retired his number. The Expos retired his number. Uh, in his rookie season in, in uh, 81, he batted a 304 as a rookie and set a rookie record for stolen bases at 71. Uh, he was runner-up for Rookie of the Year that year. Um, in nine, er, in 83, he stole a career-high 90 bases and scored 133 runs, which was a franchise record. Uh, he was the Expos Player of the Year in 83, 85, and 86. Um, he stole 70 bases from 81 to 86 in each one of those seasons. He stole, he stole 70 bases in all those seasons. Batted 334 in 86, which is when he won the batting champion. Uh, he consistently had high on-base percentage, great defensive player as well. Uh, despite not winning any Gold Glove awards, he led the NL with 21 assists in 83 for double plays, uh, or, and he had four double plays tied for the lead league in 85, sorry, um, by an outfielder. He finished his career with a 294 batting average, 808 stolen bases, 980 RBIs, and over 2,600 hits. This man accomplished a lot with Montreal, and he definitely needs to be on his Mount Rushmore. Great player, great outfielder, and he has the stats as an expo to be on this Mount Rushmore. His nickname was The Rock. I said that. It took him a while to get into the Hall of Fame, but he, he did finally make it. Des definitely deserved it. Jeff, as a pitcher, what is your approach going up against a leadoff hitter? Keep him off base. Yeah. Especially somebody like that can – Still bases. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing. You know, he gets on base. It just gives three and four the opportunity to drive him in because he, he's going to steal second base. He's going to get in scoring position for those guys. Um, you know, and I think I might have had a luxury of pitching against him once or twice when he was in New York in '97. Or so, but I can't remember. That's too far back for me to remember anything like that. Um, but you know, he's another guy. I don't. He's another guy. I don't understand why, other than he played in Montreal for the majority of his best years. He probably was overlooked for a Hall of Fame earlier in the career. I mean, you look at num. You look at numbers. You look at guys, and some guys get left behind because of the lack of press that they're receiving from you know they're out of they're out of the United States they're not in New York they're not in Chicago they're not in LA they're not in markets that are well known and some of these guys get left behind but I'm glad that we have that the what we have now where people like Reigns can get in who else Murray was not Murray there's somebody else who just got in not too long ago that was in the same boat that he was in, almost ineligible to get in. I think Jack Morris was one of Jack them. Jack Morris, we mentioned him earlier. Yeah, and Bert, Bert Bylevin didn't. It, it, yeah, he was another there. one too. Yeah, you know, um, but you know, my my goal if I'm pitching him is figure out how to get him out quick. That way, I know that he's hitting my pitches and keep him off base. Right. But, I mean. He would he numbers that he put up in Montreal and the awards that he got in Montreal or were outstanding. Brian, anybody come to your mind other than Ricky Henderson who would be a better leadoff hitter than Tim Raines? Uh, well, I mean, Otis Nixon is up there too. <laughs> yeah, um, was... yeah, before, but but yeah, I mean, if you, get, if you get a guy that that, that can hit that well. Um, and he's got that much speed, you just you know, it'd be such a th uh, threat to go to get in a scoring position, as Jeff said, uh, you know, right off the bat. That's just uh, that's such a super bad. Yeah, well, let's move on to our final outfielder tonight. That's Andre Dawson. 
you know, he is in the Hall of Fame with an Expos hat. So I know that's uh, always a big thing. What hat are they wearing in the Hall of Fame? Um, yeah. I, I know he was a little unhappy about that. He wanted – made some comments about it. He would have preferred it to be the Cubs. But he – the largest part of his career was definitely with Montreal. So he spent 10 years with the Expos, 1976 to 86. Um, and with the Expos, he was a three-time All-Star, a Rookie of the Year in 1977, six-time Gold Glove winner. So this guy could field and hit cleanup. He's three-time Silver Slugger Award winner. Um, he's fifth all-time in games played for Montreal, third in runs, third in home runs, third in RBIs. And he's eighth in batting average, which, you know, a lot of power hitters in the 80s weren't hitting for average as well. So, you know, Andre could do it both. Um, he's fourth in hits in Montre uh, in uh, Expos history. So the Expos retired his jersey as well, number 10. Um, and in 2010, there was he went into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And as I mentioned, he was wearing the Expos hat. But, you know, he is kind of remembered – for winning an MVP with the Cubs because they were in last place and he still won the MVP. But his career with Montreal can't be understated. I mean, he finished runner-up for MVP two times with the Expos and it was top 10 another time. So um, a good chunk of his career was spent there and I don't think he should be overlooked in tonight's Mount Rushmore. But So, Jeff, I asked you how you approach a, a leadoff hitter. How are you going to approach a, a cleanup hitter, a power hitter like, like an Andre Dawson type? Well, for me to I – d- I had to face him. I faced him a couple times. And, you know, he gets in the box. He's intimidating because he's big to begin with. And my, I always had a philosophy anyway. It was big and strong. I was pitching him inside because I didn't want him to hit the ball back at me. So it was tell my th- third baseman. So, But most of the guys that are big and tall don't like the ball in because they can't get their arms extended. So my philosophy with them was – to tie them up as much as I can and try to limit their kind of damage. Um, but he did have right center gap power too. So you had to be careful with him. If he stayed inside a ball, he could drive the ball out that way. Um, he's another guy. I mean, he played 10 seasons in Montreal, you know, and that AstroTurf up there and playing on that probably ruined his knees or his numbers – going on even after that probably would have been better or you know throughout his whole career I mean he started having a lot of knee problems towards the last few years of his career but he's another guy that you know I didn't get to see him in his prime in Montreal I kind of wish I would that way I could compare him better to Larry but he had strong arm could run when he was young could hit for power could hit for average you know he did all the same well, the same things that Larry did, but, uh, you know, he was a rookie of the year too. So I, I don't know. He's, I think he should be wearing an expo hat. That's who he played 10 years. He put up his best numbers after looking at all his numbers. And I don't think he should be disappointed just because he won, won the MVP with the Cubs. I mean, like you said, he was an MVP runner up twice in Montreal, you know, and that's another thing is, I don't know who won him that year. Were the numbers that much better, or is he in Montreal and whoever won it in a marketable city like L.A. or New York? You right. know, who comes down to stuff like that? You have to look back at that and see where the writers and voters are coming from and making that big difference. You know, he right. goes in Chicago for a last place team. There's a lot of people out of Chicago voting first place votes for him. That makes a big difference for him. Right, but he's another guy. He's that's a great career. He had great numbers in Montreal, you know. And I, you know, this is it's hard to pick this Mount Rushmore that we're gonna have to pick at the end. <laughs> I think there's one that's pretty easy, but other than that, probably Larry. No, <laughs> I don't let's, know. Let's let's bring let's, it into the infield. The smallest guy on there. <laughs> let's bring it into the infield. We're gonna go uh, Tim Wallach. All right, Tim Wallach, um, he spent 13 seasons with the Expos from 1980 to 1992. Uh, This guy could get it done at the plate. Uh, He won the Silver Slugger Award twice, 1985, 1987. 
Um, he had the most doubles in the league in both 1987 and 1989. Uh, he hit 204 homers, 905 RBIs, had 31 triples, uh, 360 doubles, and a 259 batting average during his career with Montreal. Um, for both hits and RBIs, they are the highest total in, in uh, exposed franchise history. And also, he has more games played than any other um, player in Expos history. So, of all the guys we're talking about, this guy wore that jersey more often than anyone else. Um, he could get it done out in the field as well. Uh, just a, a very excellent third baseman. Um, he earned three gold gloves, 1985, 1989, 1990. Um, and baseball writer Bill James uh, called him a poor man's Brooks Robinson. So we all know Brooks Robinson was a great uh, third base, great fielding third baseman. And Tim Wallach was right, you know, in that same mold. Um, he made the NL All-Star team five times uh, during his career. Um, and, in tw and in 2014, he was inducted into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. So Tim Wallach is one of those guys that you, that you definitely think of when you think of the great Expos. Tim Wallach's like synonymous with the Expos. He might not have the the stats of some of the other guys, but, you know, when you thought Expos in the in the 80s, early 90s, like, this was the guy that came to mind. Jeff, mm -hmm. I, what, what are your thoughts on Tim Wallach? Oh, love the guy. I mean, he, he's another one. He's like Dennis. He was a position player, though, but, you know, he kind of took me under his wing, too. I mean, I was lucky with the uh, veterans that we had on that team, um, you know, and it was great. He was... He was basically another Kyle Ripken. You couldn't keep him out of the lineup no matter what he did. I mean, and at the time, he was a pretty clutch hitter for us, you know. He's the guy that we wanted at the plate when I was there the first couple of years, you know, before he got traded to the Dodgers. Um, but he was a leader on and off the field for all of us, and uh, – He's another guy, you know, he put up great numbers in Montreal. He had a lot of success up there. I mean, they've there's been a lot of good guys that have moved there. I mean, unfortunately, they don't get to stay there much longer than six years. So there's been a few guys. I mean, Wallet got to stay there for a long time. Rogers played his whole career there. That was awesome. But, you know, it was just unfortunately some of these guys couldn't stay their whole career there. I think, you know. If you look at him and he could have stayed there all his whole career would have been, he would have, he would have numbers and nobody in the Nationals will even catch up to. Let's move on to our final player tonight. I'm going behind the plate, Gary yeah. Carter. Yeah, Jeff will confirm that in front of every good pitcher, there's going to be a good catcher. So Gary is nicknamed the kid, born in Culver City in 1954, played 19 years in the MLB. Unfortunately, Gary's no longer with us. He ended up passing on in February of, of, two, of uh, 2012. But uh, as I was looking at Gary, I, there was a lot of interesting stuff about him. Interestingly enough, he ended up he played quarterback in high school in Fullerton and um, received more than 100 athletic scholarship offers. So he goes on and sends in a letter of intent to play football for the UCLA Bruins as a quarterback. But then he ends up signing with the Montreal Expos after they selected him in the third round, 53rd overall in the 1972 Major League Baseball uh, draft. He ends up playing with the Expos from 74 to 84. So when the Expos drafted him in 72, they actually wanted him to play shortstop. Which I was like, what? I don't, you never think of him as a shortstop. And it wasn't until 1974 when the Expos converted him to a catcher. His official rookie year was 75, and he split time between catcher and not shortstop. It was catcher and right field. So if you think about that, he's got the abilities here to play shortstop, right field, catcher. I mean, we're not talking like Kevin Adams rotating from the left side of the bench to the right side of the bench. We're talking about this guy playing behind <laughs> the plate, playing outfield, playing shortstop. So he ends up having some injuries that kind of – stun his play early on, but the Expos make him a full-time catcher because they put together an outfield of Warren Cromarty, Ellis Valentine, and some dude named Andre Dawson. Not sure if we've heard of him. But Gary's known for being crafty and excellent defensively. 
he kind of puts his leadership on display when he caught Charlie Lee's no hitter on May 10th, 1981. Has a great career with uh, the Expos. He played over 2,200 games in the MLB, 1503 for the Expos, had 823 RBIs for the Expos, 220 home runs for the Expos. He's a 2003 Hall of Fame inductee. Really, really good defensive catcher, but not a bad average either. It would still be pretty good in today's uh, baseball. He batted 262 for his career, an 11 time All Star. I, I was going to mention here that he won a World Series with the Mets, and that's kind of what people think about. But Kevin made me feel so terrible for doing that that I actually made the decision not to even bring that up. So I'm not going to bring that up. <laughs> well, Paul, you, you, you mentioned that, that, like, when I think Gary Carter, like, I think of how good of a hitter he was. You know, it doesn't really come to mind right, up, right at the beginning that this guy could call a good game yeah. and he could throw people out. Uh, Jeff, what, what, kind of, what kind of game does, does he call? Well, I, I, he calls a great game. I get, he came his last year of playing was in Montreal. He finished his career in Montreal, you know, and it was so, like, he was so big back there. I mean, he set up so big. He made the target look enormous when you were throwing to him. And he received so well. For, as big as he was back there, and, I mean, you know, I – I watched him, you know, with the Mets mostly because that's basically the era of me growing up and being in the baseball, being well playing when I was playing more like college and getting drafted. But uh, I was, I'm so thankful I got the opportunity to play with him his last year. Another great guy, uh, outstanding guy. Um, everything that's ever been said about him true about being how, how good he is um and it was kind of disappointing when we heard about his, his death but uh i mean I'm, he, he could still throw the ball second when he was catching i mean he didn't move he didn't move great he, his knees were really killing him his last year but the biggest thing the, the greatest thing was for me with him was his last at bat as an expo he hit a double they took him out of the game. So nice. he got to end his career with a base hit. And he's probably in Montreal where it all started. But uh, that, that's I mean, a beautiful ending to a career. Yes, it was. Wow. Like Jeter. Yeah, like Jeter. So, yes. yeah, this guy, Carter, man, I mean, he could be on the Mount Rushmore of catchers. He was that good. But all right, let's move into our vote. Brian, you're in my corner. Go ahead. Wow, you're going to put the pressure on me. Um, okay, why well, I, I look at it like this. I, the, the first guy that I think of when I look at this list is Tim Raines. I mean, Tim Raines was just – he was so consistent and so such a great um, uh, leadoff hitter. I mean, and he, he, could steal the, he could steal bases as well, too. So I, I got to have Tim Raines on that list. Okay. Kevin? Um, I got to go with Andre Dawson. Um, yeah, I'm just going to keep it short. Okay. Paul? I agree with Brian. So he kind of took Tim Raines. I don't really think about him when I think about the Expo. So I, I'll go, since I can't pick my own, I'll go with Tim Wallach. I liked his length of career there. and Yeah, he seemed like a clubhouse guy. Ah, <laughs> uh, wow. So let's see. I was actually going to go Tim Wallach, and you took him off me. So, wow. Um, gosh, we're going to have a pitcher on this list. So, I'm going with Dennis Martinez because uh, he really represented him, the ace of that staff for a while. So, I'm going to go with Dennis Martinez. All right. Jeff, what are you, your four for the Mount Rushmore? I have four for the Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Gary Carter. Carter. Is one of them. Pedro Martinez, Steve Rogers, for having his whole career played there. There you go. And numbers he put up, and Larry Walker. Larry oh my Walker. gosh, Jeff, those were phenomenal picks. <laughs> he, he's just a, the guy is sharp, man. And he, he picked he picked the exact four that we didn't. So there you go. 
Yeah, yeah that's Kevin. Yeah, that way Pickens. everybody that way everybody got to be on it. Touche. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those Mount Rushmore's that can go any way. <laughs> it is really cool. It is, yeah, it is, it is definitely. But uh, let, let's move into our Q and A, uh, and we'll we'll start with you, Brian. Go ahead. Okay. Um, all right, Jeff. So I understand that you had a, you had a change up, a fastball, a slider, and a fork ball. So how did you originally develop your fork ball, and how often would you use it during a game? Okay. So we can eliminate the changeup because the changeup was really my fork ball. It just did so much different things. So I had, as a lefty, as a lefty, I had trouble throwing a changeup. So when I was in the Cardinal organization, I went to uh, winter ball, and the pitching coach that went down there for the team was a Cardinal pitching coach, and we discussed something that I have to figure out a changeup, and we started tinkering with all different things, and all of a sudden. One of the guys, um, Jeff Gray, was down there. He used to pitch for Boston. And he kind of had a, a mock-type fork ball and was showing me what he was doing with it. So we started playing catch with it, uh, me and the pitching coach. And I just kept spreading my lit fingers and fingers till I developed it enough. And I used the fork ball as my out pitch. So, or if I, if I had a good idea, guys, swinging you know, the first pitch, I would throw it then. But it was my out pitch from strikeouts, if I needed a strikeout. Um, slider and fastballs were the primary pitches, and the fork ball was the out pitch. Paul. Jeff, when I was looking at your career and, and how you, when you started in the MLB, you were kind of an older rookie. I think you ended up coming in there full-time at 28. Um, my question for you is, did you maintain absolute confidence, you know, up until 28? Did you did you just know you were going to still make it? I mean, or, or did you ever have doubts and were starting to investigate maybe maybe other options? Um, I started having doubts, um, you know, but I still had it in my heart. And I was going to play until they took the jersey off my um, back. My wife agreed. She was in my corner the whole time. Um, I think a lot of the problems I had was coming up in the minor leagues, I was bouncing back between starter and bullpen guy and never had anything consistent. And then three years in a row, I got in the pen and got the regular work as the pen guy. And that was the break that I needed to get to the big leagues. I mean, velocity was there. The pitches were there. It just was like I hadn't trained my body going back and forth it was a different thing I believe and finally once I got that break of staying in the pen for three years and putting up solid numbers I finally got my break Kevin the reason why I'm wearing a Pittsburgh jersey is because I'm from Pittsburgh originally but I want to take you back to, <laughs> I want to take you back to 1994 against the Pittsburgh Pirates you had the no hitter uh, with one out left, kind of, what do you, what's going through your mind at that moment? You have one out left and the no hitter on the line. How was it? Like, what were the emotions and whatnot going under that last batter there? You know, it's, for me, it was to, to get the guy out. I knew it. I knew what he was. And I knew what I had to do. I mean, I think what was it? A one-two pitch? He got a hit. Yeah, hit you off know. your glove or something. Yeah, I jammed the crap out of him. His bat shattered. Lost the ball, came back to me as a changeup. And when I went to catch it, it wasn't there. And it went off the back of my glove, and I didn't see which way it went. You know, and you're going, I had two pitches I could have thrown, that or my fork ball at the time. But I had thrown the fork ball the pitch before. Actually, I didn't even want to swing it. The ball was in off the plate. I was getting them off of it so that I could throw the fork ball the next pitch because my mind's thinking, how am I setting him up? What am I using for two pitches? I want a two pitch out right now. And unfortunately he swung at it. And, uh, and it, it's like the biggest disappointment when I, I mean, the play was bang, bang at first base. And it's just like, oh shit. Eight and two thirds of no hit baseball. It, it was going in, going into that last batter, like mentally, is it like, 
are you thinking about it in your head or are you just kind of like actually no walking out no no you know you're not actually thinking about it at all i wasn't and i don't think a lot of pitchers do i mean it might have been different it might be different for guys that got perfect games that you're thinking about because now you don't want to walk a guy but i had walked a couple guys that game so it was you know it's just get this guy out that's all i was thinking about you know it's it was a heartbreak right so at 34 years old, you pitch in your first playoff game in 1997. This is a, it's a gem against the Baltimore Orioles. Eight innings, only give up one run, strike out three. I mean, at 34 years old, that's a long time to wait to get into a playoff game. So what is your mindset with that? Like, you knowing that you're going to pitch in the playoffs and what's on the line and, and all that? Yeah. What was on? We were down 0-2 oh, oh, already. That was on the lines. How could I win this game and keep us in? And it, watching that game, it didn't start out very well. I had the bases loaded and we have no outs? One out. I think bases loaded and one out. And then uh, had a ball come back and hit my foot and I got the double play off of it. You know, it was – the night before I went out to dinner, I'll tell you, I went out to dinner with my wife and my parents were in town and uh, we were coming back to the bar and Lou Pinello was sitting in there and he called me over. He goes, just sit down and have a drink with me. I go, I don't like to drink the night before I pitch. He goes, well, I'm your manager and I'm telling you sit down and have a drink. He goes, what's the worst thing we can do? You can lose tomorrow and we go home or you can win tomorrow and we can continue to play and hope Randy can win the next game for us. But uh, so he, uh, you know, he kind of relaxed me. He said, just go out there and have fun. You know, it's a playoff game. It's your first one. Enjoy it and always remember it. Um, you know, and I, I've gone back a couple times. I have the video of it and watched some of it and watched the game transpire. But it was a little nightmare when I got taken out of the game because our bullpen that year wasn't very good. And, you know, so, but. I mean, that, that was exciting. And, I, you know, I got the opportunity to pitch in a couple more, you know, with St. Louis and um, Texas. But uh, getting the start your first time, there's so much adrenaline. Like, there were, it's adrenaline and butterflies if you can have both. You know, and this is like I've already got six years in the big leagues and you're still getting them. But that just means that's how big the game was. Well, Paul, Jeff put two of your guys on the Mount Rushmore, so I'll give you last question tonight. Well, I, I consider Jeff a really, really good pitcher, so I want to get his pitching perspective on this. We talked about Gary Carter. Gary Carter, by the way, just looking at his baseball card, it looks like he's such a nice guy, and you said he was. He just like got that look to him. But we talked about Gary catching Charlie Lee's no-hitter, and you were in no-hitter territory like Kevin mentioned, which I think is – fascinating that it came down to that last at bat how much credit does a catcher get during a no hitter and you know on your no hitter when you were going to that two-thirds inning there was that your call on that pitch or was that the catcher's call um I think we both agreed on it yeah. he called it because he knew that we, we were, he knew that we were trying to set up the next pitch to hopefully strike the guy out because it would have been great to strike the last hitter out too. And uh, we both agreed on it. I mean, catcher plays a big part in it, but I think they get nervous. You know, you know, you got a no hitter going. Nobody's sitting next to you. Nobody's yeah. talking to you. And not hardly even the catcher, but um, I think a catcher plays a big part into it because to, to throw a no hitter, you got, you guys got to, you got to be on the same page the whole game. And um, when you get on a page like that, it makes it easy for the pitcher and the catcher. I mean, he's going to put this finger down. You're going to agree. You're going to, you know you're going to throw that pitch, and it, there's not a lot of shaking off when you're throwing a game. I mean, I threw – you know, I went eight and two-thirds. No, I pitched a game in Philadelphia, which I really think's the best game I ever pitched in my career. I didn't walk anybody. I gave up two hits. Um, and one was – I was perfect for – what, five and two-thirds? Because the pitcher's the one that got the first hit off me. 
<clears throat> but we are we are on the same page that whole game too. I mean, a, a catcher is so important to how you work, and you know, if he knows you, if you have him around for a long time, that you know, you get to work with a catcher, the same catcher all the time. It makes it so much easier. Brian, you look like you were disappointed when I said last question. So go ahead, give him one more. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, Jeff, from, from 1996 to 1998, you had 14 complete games. Um, how were you able to stay so durable during that time? And what are your thoughts on how current managers use pitch, pitch counts? <laughs> I don't know if you want, really want me to answer this one. Uh, for me, it was, well, I took care of my body, but I also, you know, mechanically was sound, you know, um, I think there's the lack of injuries is because there was a lack of weight lifting. We lifted weights, but we didn't lift weights like I see these guys lifting now. Um, and for me, as a starter, my goal, I was, I was starting the game and I was finishing the game. So mine was a mindset. And if you look at today's pitchers, the pitch counts, the problem is they put pitch counts in. And all the pitchers think about is pitch counts. I'm going to throw my 90 pitches. And they don't really think about pitching. They just go, I'm going to get to 90 pitches. When I get 90 pitches or 100 pitches, they're just going to take me out instead of using them effectively. I mean, I always looked at a game, like when I was starting, that I like to pitch fast. I want the games over quick. And that's why we loved to play the Braves when it was like 90 – Four to ninety six or ninety three to ninety six, because when it was Pedro and me and Kenny and it was Glavin, Maddox and Smoltz, those games were over in like two hours and ten minutes, yeah. and it was so fun playing baseball like that. But they all all of us had the same mindset: we're going to start the game, we're going to finish the game. And these guys nowadays they don't have it; they just got a pitch count in their head, and that's all they're pitching for. And I look at it this way: my goal was to get out of every inning with twelve pitches. You know, and nowadays, these guys are throwing 20, 21 pitches on average per inning. So there's no thought of – it's just a number. You know, there's no thought about pitching to these guys. Throw it hard and see what happens. Well, I remind everybody, subscribe to whatever you're listening to this show on. Hit that subscribe button. Thank you to Jeff Vicero for joining us tonight. Honor to have a Montreal Expo on. Love that. Well, it was fun, guys. Thanks. I enjoyed Thanks. it. Thank you. Good night, everyone.